today we're going to talk a bit about uh, modern application development uh, for any domain. Um, today, you know, application development uh, spans the, the breadth of desktop to mobile device to embedded device, and more and more customers are expecting user interfaces that uh, meet their expectations that they're, they're used to on, on touch kind of oriented devices. And um, the Qt framework is really poised to assist development and developers in building that kind of a user interface. Um, and so we'll, we're going to talk about this today. Um, go to my next here. So, so today, uh, for those who may not be familiar, I'm going to introduce a little bit about the Qt framework. Um, we'll uh, talk a little bit about uh, what it does and, and how it can enable you to build your applications, and then the, the various domains that, that it enables you to support. Um, and, and just for anyone who's wondering, the framework is officially called Qt, but I always called it Qt as a developer, and we answered it either one, so take your pick. So just as kind of an introduction, the Qt framework, again, if you're not familiar, it's been around for 25 years uh, under active development. Um, it's, it's been stable, it's been used <laughs> across multiple industries for, for all that time. Um, it began in 95 with a focus on cross-platform desktop applications built using C++, and uh, that's using our Qt Widgets UI toolkit. And, uh, and then with Qt 5 in 2012, we began to turn our attention over to the embedded space. And, and we wanted to create uh, the ability to build more modern, fluid, uh, animated, and responsive applications. And so that's where we developed our Qt Quick uh, toolkit and framework. So it's a stable, proven platform. It's used across all industries and available on all major operating systems and platforms. Um, that's really our, our goal and our, our intention is to, to, to remain as agnostic as possible to the platform. So uh, we view a framework as more than just a collection of libraries. Um, we see them as providing structure, right, uh, and, and helpful shortcuts and features to improve the development experience. Um, by providing kind of a consistent API and a, a consistent workflow, um, you're able to uh, to, to build an expertise and a knowledge base that, that is easily shared amongst the team rather than pulling in separate libraries with different uh, codes, code syntax, different uh, uh, capabilities, and having to kind of learn and how to put piece those together. Um, in addition to user interface tools, um, the Qt framework provides many internal features and add-on modules that simplify uh, common development tasks. Uh, things like memory management and C++, that's always a headache. Um, networking, concurrency operations, sensor input, inter-process communication, uh, 3D rendering and, and content. There's just a, a massive amount of, of libraries that are available within the framework. And because we bring them in in a platform abstracted way, an agnostic way, uh, you're able to, to use that code across many different domains. So as I said, you know, we had two kind of UI toolkits within the framework. We have Qt Widgets and Qt Quick. Um, Qt Widgets has been focused, uh, as I said, on the desktop application developments with more static layouts. Uh, it uses an imperative coding model in C++, and, and the UI itself is all rendered with software rendering, uh, just out of, a fr out of a frame buffer. Um, Qt Quick, on the other hand, was focused on embedded devices, um, often devices with touch. Uh, the, and, and, and that want to have kind of a modern responsive look and feel. And so to that end, uh, we developed it to be GPU accelerated to take advantage of that uh, using OpenGL as, as an abstraction. Um, it provides easy animations and transitions that don't tax the CPU, which is often uh, you know, in short supply on an embedded device. Um, and, and it really enables rapid prototyping um, of, of your UI because you can kind of see it's this JSON structure where you're building out a, um, you know, a hierarchy of, of objects and you're compositing together your UI in a pretty natural uh, way. Um, so we call this a declarative coding model. Um, it's modern, it's similar to some of the other, uh, you know, toolkits that have been released, but, you know, Apple's got Swift and, and Google's got Flutter and they're often using similar types of syntax here. 
Um, and, and this also, QML also supports JavaScript for scripting. It's full ECMAScript 7 uh, JavaScript engine that you can use for uh, manipulating your user, user interface and doing state transitions and things like that. And then finally, uh, here in the end of 2019, we introduced a brand new offering that's uh, cute on microcontrollers. And if you're like me, who's a front-end high-level high uh, UI developer, uh, at heart, I, I had no idea what a microcontroller was before. Uh, but they're ultra-low-powered embedded devices, right? They don't typically have a GPU, or uh, they may have very uh, minimal graphics acceleration, 2D kind of graphics acceleration. Um, uh, so we, we rolled out uh, a way to basically take our cute quick uh, toolkit and framework and simplify it down into something that can fit on the low memory footprint, low uh, flash storage footprint of these microcontrollers. Um, you know, you're often dealing in the megabytes, not the gigabytes, almost always on a microcontroller. And so that was a, a big effort. But we were able to bring kind of that same QML development language down to such a low level and fit it in and, uh, and continue to iterate on that. Um, which, so, you know, for embedded devices, this can reduce cost because microcontrollers are cheaper, especially at volume, than some of the application processors. Um, and it can, um, and then it also reduces cost by letting the developer use a high level language like QML while still getting the performance uh, that they need out of, because it gets compiled. And so, you know, kind of where we stand today is you know, Qt 6 has just been released. So it's our next major release. Um, and, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the features that it brings in as we go into some of the more interactive uh, demo portion of, of my talk. Um, but it, it's basically a cleanup of the APIs, kind of a restructuring and, and a, a refactoring of removing deprecated functionality, updating us to modern language standards. We had been on C++ 11 for quite a while. Um, and so we've standardized now on C++ 17 uh, with the release of Qt 6. Um, and then we've optimized the graphical rendering. So rather than relying on OpenGL to abstract all of our GPU ex uh, accelerated rendering, uh, you're able to take advantage of the native graphics APIs. So Metal on, on Apple devices, uh, Direct3D if you're on a Windows machine or Windows desktop or Vulkan on Linux or uh, most embedded devices. Um, so, so those are some of the key things that we brought in with Qt 6, and it really sets us up moving forward to be able to continue to advance into this, uh, this realm of creating responsive, beautiful user interfaces uh, for, for customers. And so, as I said, you know, our goal is to provide UI solutions across many industries. Uh, many of you may have used a Qt-based UI without realizing it. Uh, we're on, you know, TVs, consu you know, consumer electronics, industrial electronics, as well as desktop applications uh, that are well known and widely used. And now the part we've all been waiting for. Uh, I'm a developer at heart, so I, I love to get into the nitty gritty of the code. And so we're going to take a look at some of the C++ structure of the Qt framework and some of the new features within Qt 6 uh, that, we've, that we've brought in. And then, uh, and then we'll kind of take a look at also at our QML and JavaScript, and then we'll look at Python. Uh, so, so what we're looking at here is uh, the Qt Creator IDE, which is our IDE. Um, you can make use of uh, any IDE that you're comfortable with when you develop in the Qt framework. We've got plugins for Visual Studio and Visual Studio Code um, has uh, support for, for the various language features we have. Um, so, so it's definitely extensible. Um, Qt Creator is a fine IDE and I, I enjoy it anyway. So what we're looking at is a class, uh, pretty obvious uh, person class. Um, we're inheriting from a Q object, which is the core object within the Qt framework. Um, every, every class, nearly every class, uh, except basic types, inherits from this because it provides us with uh, some of the, the magic that we do within the framework. So we call it a meta object compiler, uh, which is able to extract data uh, from, the, Q ob from the, the C++ class and from the Q object and enable us to do introspection on the various members of it and provide accessors to those in, in a, a clever, clever ways. 
um, to integrate across different languages. So that's what a queue object brings to you. And some of the things that, that I'm making use of within it are a, a property system, which is a, uh, this is a public property that can be ac accessed uh, either from other C++ classes or from QML, um, which is always handy because the QML is really focused on the front end UI. And when you want to do the heavy lifting and your, your, you know, your long running operations and managing you know, threading and things like that, that all uh, needs to happen in the C++ backend. Um, so I've got four properties for a person. I've got first, last, and full name, and I've got age. Uh, I'm declaring this as a QML element, which is another macro that essentially automatically registers this class with the QML engine. And, and then we've got the constructor. You'll notice that the constructor takes an, another Q object pointer as a parent. And so this is one of the first uh, and, and uh, really neat uh, additions that we're able to bring uh, when you're developing in Qt for C++ is um, object ownership, this concept of memory ownership, um, so that you can create hierarchies of objects. And if you provide a parentage to your, your new dynamically created classes, then uh, memory cleanup is managed by that hierarchy. So if I instantiate this person as a child of another class, then I am able to, um, uh, when it's destroyed, I'm able to get that cleaned up and I don't have to deal with uh, cleaning up that memory. Um, kind of the next thing to, that, that you'll notice is this queue bindable type uh, and this, this, these functions here. Um, so this is a new func feature in Qt 6. Um, the, the concept of binding properties together was a very powerful one and one that was built into QML. And it's very easy to do, and you'll see some of that. Um, but we didn't have the same equivalent, you know, simple, simple solution within C++. And so when we moved to Qt 6, one of our goals was to, to try to provide a, a, a low, you know, low overhead way to uh, connect properties to each other between C++ classes because this kind of dependent child or this dependency uh, is, is very handy and very, very useful. And so that's what the Q bindable uh, class enables. And then you see that I'm declaring some Q properties uh, here. Uh, they're a templated type. And, uh, and so these are essentially the private members that are tied uh, to the, the public uh, API. And I'm using a shortcut within Q property called member, so I don't have to define my own getters and setters, um, but we support the ability to define, you know, a getter and setter, so you can do some custom logic within those cases if you need to. Um, and so that's all uh, supported uh, what different ways that you can make use of properties within C++. And if I jump over to the, the constructor in my CPP, um, basically, I'm initializing my variables and I'm creating a binding um, in C++. So my full name is not going to get an initialization because it really is dependent on the two other properties, first name and last name. Um, so what I'm doing here is uh, creating a lambda function and returning the m first name and m last name property values with a space in between, and that is my full name. And any time that either of these two property values gets updated, my full name property will automatically update to reflect that new value. And so that's, that's how a binding works uh, within C++. And so uh, with that, let's move on and take a look at uh, Qt and QML JavaScript. Uh, it's an extension here of the same project. So I'll start by opening up the main QML file and you can kind of get another look at the declarative style of the coding here. I'm instantiating a rectangle, which is one of the basic types in QML. It just has a width height, the background color. Um, and within that, I'm, I'm instantiating a person form, which is another QML type. You'll, see, you'll notice over here that I have my person form.ui.qml file. So this is actually instantiating that. Um, so this is making use automatically of that parent-child hierarchy that I mentioned with C++. So QML is not an interpreted language. It's not like JavaScript in a, in a web browser 
all the code gets compiled in the bytecode. Um, you can either do that just in time, uh, so that gives you some flexibility. If you want to have, uh, you know, plain text QML files on your device, so you can update those, it'll get just in time compiled and cached, um, or you can pre-compile that into that, uh, into that bytecode so that you uh, save that initial overhead. Uh, but either way, it's always running native, so you get uh, you know, full top-end you know, top, top performance out of it. Um, here is I'm instantiating my person class, which is the class that I just exposed here uh, by saying this is a QML element. Um, so my person class is uh, pro I'm providing an instance of it, declaring it, and that instantiates it. And then I provide an ID, which basically functions as a pointer or a reference to that class. And I can reference all the public API of that uh, directly here from within QML by referencing that ID. And, and so uh, within QML, how you do a binding, uh, you can see right here, my display text, I'm actually creating a binding to my backend class full name property. And so any time that full name changes, my display text will be updated to reflect that. Uh, my age is tied directly to the age class. Um, and then I'm gonna have an update signal within this person form we'll take a look at. And if whenever I update, I'm gonna grab the first name text, last name text, and age text, and assign those back into my backend. And so this again is just JavaScript function call, but this is a, me passing data back into the C++ layer where I can then take it and manipulate it, uh, pass it around, do whatever I may need to do. So if we take a look at the person form, so anything that begins with a, or that ends with a .ui.qml extension, um, that indicates that it was developed using our designer, which is a WYSIWYG tool uh, to, to build out your UI. Um, if you're like me, as I'm gonna pull it up, if you're like me and you're a developer, uh, you tend to prefer getting your hands on and understanding how the code works, and that's perfectly fine. Um, what this tool can help in is basically providing you with uh, some, some easy ways to translate between a UI and UX team and your actual product. Um, the tool can actually import uh, uh, Photoshop and uh, Sketch and Figma designs straight from a UI graphics team. And it can generate QML components that can be reused um, for you directly out of those tools. So, you know, depending on your workflow, it can save you a lot of time. At the very least, if you have a UI UX team, it can get you into a, to a place where you can prototype things. Um, it may not be the final code that you've been able to optimize, but it can get you to prototype really quickly. Uh, in my case, I used it to drag and drop some controls. I've got a button here, uh, my text input fields, as you can see. Um, if I click on some of these, uh, you, you get the full, you know, property, graphical property manipulations here. Um, I can do things like set bindings. So if I go into my, my age text, uh, let's see, I think, yes, I've got a binding here. So if I take a look at that, I'm essentially graphically creating a binding from the slider value to this age, uh, age text. So that lets me adjust that with a the slider. Um, these are some of our cute quick controls that we provide. So you're also able to use these to provide a, a look and feel and do theming and things like that. Uh, and if I take a look at the text editor, you can see the code that was generated as I built this out. And what's most interesting is that I've, I've added some public API. So I've got my age display text and name display text. And these are alias properties. So they're not uh, declaring new memory. They're essentially pointers or references to the, the properties of these child objects. And then I have my signal when update gets clicked. And so that comes out of my button which has got a connection and here I've got a connection to the button on clicked handler. And so I'm doing JavaScript code in here. I've just got a console log every time the button gets clicked. And then I fire that signal, which then takes us back to main QML where that signal gets handled here and passes the data back to my C++ class. So I'm gonna build and run this and, and then we will uh, take a look at that. So here's the UI. Um, I can drag this around. 
Oh, actually, this is the wrong one. I've, I've my active project is the Python. Let me switch back to the C plus yeah. plus. I modified it a bit so that we would know that we're running with a different backend. Build and run. So it's the same QML file. So it looks essentially the same, except my first name and last name is in a different order. In C++, I did first space last. In Python, I did last comma first. So we would have a differentiation. So if I put Corey and fill in my last name and modify my age, I look pretty good for 60. Bad joke. Um, so you can see it's, it's updating these. It's passing that data back to C++. Here in my application output, you can see my button is clicked. Handler is getting called. Um, so we can, we can see how that works. All right, jumping, uh, jumping back over to, uh, to Python. Uh, so within, Python, within Qt, we have our Qt for Python module. And the official name within the Python community is the PySide bindings. And so that's, that's ours. There's a couple others out there. Um, this is the one that we're actively developing on and supporting. And so the latest version is PySide 6. And so for, for Python users, um, there's a number of improvements in 6. But a uh, big one is improved QML integration, which we're going to take a look at. Uh, also some special features, which we'll look at on the next slide, um, to try and kind of uh, make the syntax of the Python bindings uh, more Python-like rather than C++-like. C++ -like. Uh, and then for C++ users, we've got our Shaboken 6 uh, binding generation, uh, which allows you to hook into C++ backends. You may have business logic in C++ um, that you want to take advantage of or whatever, and the ability to continue doing that uh, is is things we're continuing to develop. So yeah, for example, the, the feature I, I was referring to, we have a feature called snake case. Um, traditionally in, in Qt for Python, this is on the right is how you would instantiate things in camel case, which is very C++-y. Um, and it, it was convenient because it was able, we were able to pull our, our APIs directly out of the Qt classes. Um, but uh, it's not very Python-like. So uh, moving over into uh, Qt 6, we're able to use this snake case feature to automatically enable a snake case style uh, syntax and property style, so you're able to use that. And so it's just the kind of thing that our team is, is actively developing to try and, and maintain uh, and build out support that, that fits with the community. Um, I'll take a look at a, a quick demo here to, to flesh out our example. So within main.py, I'm importing uh, the a number of various uh, features that we use. Um, and I'm declaring a class, uh, coincidentally or not, called person. Uh, it's also a QML element. So as you can kind of see, I'm essentially replicating my backend API uh, from C++ over here in Python. I'm going to switch to that project. Um, and so I've got a number of uh, you know, getter and setter functions. I am referencing some signals. So when I set my first name, I, I have the signal function declared. And so then I fire off the first name change signal and also the full name change signal, which is how I'm doing my binding uh, so that the full name gets updated. Um, in my case, my get full name returns last name, comma, first name, as I said. Um, and then down here, we have our, our backing values and then these properties that provide the public property syntax so that our QML can bind to it. And then uh, here in, in kind of the, the bootstrapping, I'm just essentially creating a quick view and uh, passing it my main QML file. Um, so I can actually run this in Qt Creator or I can run this from the command line just by running main.py. Um, and so you can see here that I've got last comma first, and my age is initialized to 38, which is different than I had in my C++. Um, again, if I change this, uh, give it my name and update, you can see we got last comma first. And so in this way, I've been able to basically uh, pass data back and forth between QML and Python in a, a much more seamless way than we have in the past. Um, and then, of course, from here within these functions, I can import any module that Python may support. And so that gives you a lot of power, right? Because there's tons of functionality uh, within Python, within the, the community. 
uh, that, that's not always available within C++. And so this is just another way that you can leverage the Qt framework to, to build out your UI very quickly and then still have access to these powerful libraries that are available to you. Um, so I, I, have an, I have a video, uh, a, a quick one from our, uh, one of our key developers, uh, Christian, uh, who uh, is, is kind of lead developer for Qt for Python. And in this video, he shows uh, what we call a scriptable application, which is kind of going the opposite direction. Uh, we're taking a C++ application and we're actually going to call and execute Python uh, within it. And so we'll run this just for uh, about a minute here. And I want to and the last but not least example. Right uh, scriptable application, everyone knows it. If you don't know it, it's an application written in C++ that embeds the Python interpreter so you can do things inside uh, uh, regarding uh, you know, interaction and running everything from it. So here we have it. So this is running, uh, it's running Python, and here I can change by my by myself, like uh, I don't know, um, main window uh, set style sheet and font size. I can do 30 pixels, and if I run this, this will change the whole because of course the Python interpreter is interacting with it, but I modify it a bit. Uh, if you're familiar with this example, this is kind of new. All right, for the sake of time, I'm gonna pause it right there and we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and see if I have any questions uh, that I could answer. Uh, he does go on we have, with some, some neat extensions that he's added and, and we can uh, share this video link later if you're interested in seeing uh, more. So let me switch back over to my browser and take a look and see if I have any questions. Awesome. Thank you guys for joining us. I really appreciate you, you coming out. Uh, so I see a question about sharing an application built on the framework. Uh, I'm not sure if you're referring to like some specifics uh, that you could look at in the industry. Um, I could, some of the examples I showed earlier, um, if you're familiar with an LG TV, uh, WebOS uses Qt, right, for, uh, for doing their UI. Um, trying to think of another, uh, some application development use cases. Um, we have uh, Tableau has used us for, for their desktop applications for, for data visualization. Um, probably uh, one that a lot of folks in the creative space know, Maya, Autodesk Maya, uh, uses Qt at, for building out their application. Uh, and then, yeah, I see Christine provided you with a great link uh, where you can see more about some of the, the applications, some of our resources. Or there's a lot of good stuff out there. What's the difference between Qt and something like PhoneGap? Well, I am not familiar with PhoneGap, so I, I can't answer uh, too much without doing a little Google research. Um, if you want to pass paste a little more high level, I can tell you a little more about uh, how we might differentiate. Uh, the other thing is, uh, after we're done with this, uh, I know they'll shut off questions. Uh, you feel free to meet me over in the Qt booth. I'll go over there and join Christine, and, and I'll be there to respond to chats as well if you have questions. Um, but uh, so that looks like all the questions I see right now, uh, and we, but we still have a couple of minutes, so feel free to to ask any others that you may have. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. I definitely like the framework, as you can tell. Uh, came, sounds great. Thank you, Tamar. Uh, definitely uh, have have enjoyed my my experience coming over to to the and, and being on the sales side, right? Which is maybe the dark side if you're a developer. Um, I try to bring some of that. Uh, experience so that I can, you know, be, be, you know, upfront with the customer and, and determine is it, is it going to be a good fit for you or not? It might not be, but, uh, but I, I find that often it is, it's just very flexible. 
Limitations on using Qt Visual Studio extension. Uh, no, that is that extension is actually published in the Visual Studio marketplace. So you can pull it in. Um, what it does is provide some language extensions so that you can do QML within Visual Studio and it recognizes the syntax. Um, and it also does a lot of uh, things to help. Uh, we have all our tool kits, uh, you know, are the, um, the, the, uh, the tool chains for, for doing your build and compile. Uh, we, com we combine those along with the cute libraries that are built with those tool chains into what we call a kit. And so you're able to, uh, to make use of uh, those kits in Qt Creator by default, but that extension gives you that in Visual Studio as well. So it just simplifies the process of getting everything set up and deploying the target devices if you're cross compiling and things like that. You're welcome. I, I believe they'll be uh, they'll be cutting us off here in just a, a minute. But it was a pleasure to speak with you all. Thank you for attending. And